thank you all for being here. And uh, uh, I want uh, to put uh, the rules of the game. You know that uh, each speaker has uh, between around uh, eight uh, to ten minutes for his presentation. So uh, please uh, try not to uh, exceed the time, uh, the limited time. Uh, I will start uh, with uh, Konstantinos Antonopoulos, Professor Antonopoulos uh, of Public uh, International Law to, at the Faculty of Law of the Democritus University of Russia, uh, who is going to speak about the Treaty of Lausanne, peace uh, through realism and not uh, the rule of law. Professor Antonopoulos, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson. I wish to uh, uh, thank, uh, express my thanks to uh, the organizers uh, of this uh, uh, conference uh, for the invitation to present uh, a paper. This conference uh, marks the centenary of the Treaty of Lausanne. It's a high uh, watermark. But uh, in the context of the uh, Greek international legal community, uh, uh, as it happens, it follows the 90th uh, uh, anniversary, which was uh, uh, celebrated by the International Law Association Hellenic branch 10 years ago in this very uh, conference room. Uh, the subject of uh, this panel is um, um, the Treaty of Lausanne as a mechanism to achieve uh, peace building, uh, peace. And I uh, would like to submit to you that it um, uh, did, it has achieved peace, but uh, a very high, but at a very high price concerning uh, the rule of law. Uh, the Treaty of Lausanne achieved uh, the peace between, um, on the one hand, the victorious untanned powers uh, in the First World War, and on the other hand, Turkiye, uh, uh, which emerged uh, as a result of um, the direct and forcible dispute renunciation of the peace treaty of Sever by the nationalist movement under the leadership of uh, Mustafa Kemal. And in the armed conflict that uh, ensued uh, in the attempt to enforce the terms of the treaty of Sev on this movement, uh, the victorious side, the victorious power, was the newly established uh, Turkey. Yes. So it's a, a, a unique peace treaty because one of the victorious powers in the uh, First World War uh, had the position of the vanquished party in the armed conflict that ended in the late summer of 1922. Uh, so the Treaty of Lausanne has achieved in a more particular fashion uh, the peace between Greece and Turkey by totally disregarding the nascent protection of human rights and by granting amnesty for atrocities committed during and immediately after the First World War against the Christian communities of the Ottoman Empire. Even though a judicial mechanism of prosecuting crimes against humanity had been established. In this manner, peace has been achieved at the expense of justice and the rule of law. What was unique about this, uh, what was unique about uh, first the exchange of population? Because I, 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 I'll submit to you that. Uh, uh, peace w was achieved uh, at the expense of justice and the rule of law in relation to the exchange of population and the granting of amnesty. What was unique about this exchange of population was that it was compulsory. 
Until that moment, the exchange of populations was optional, voluntary. And the precedents were an exchange, a voluntary exchange of population between Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empire in 1913, and uh, the voluntary exchange of population between uh, Bulgaria and Greece under the Peace Treaty of May of 1919. The compulsory exchange in Lausanne was suggested by Friedrich Nansen, the League of Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, but its real author has remained a matter of controversy. It was immediately accepted by Turkey and ultimately by Greece. For Turkey it, it presented the opportunity of achieving ethnic homogeneity and dispensing with the presence of large Christian of a large Christian minority that had invited foreign intervention and an attempt to disrupt its territorial integrity. For Greece, the priority was to settle the refugees in land to be vacated by its Muslim citizens and in a long-term goal to achieve an ethnic Greek majority in the northern province of Macedonia. But the compulsory exchange of populations barely concealed the post facto legitimization of violent expulsion and the commission of atrocities as well as the total disregard of the wishes of the individuals concerned to freely choose their place of residence. In 1928, just five years after the conclusion of the Exchange of Populations Treaty, the late Professor Stylianos Seferiadis, <coughs> excuse me, the eminent Greek international lawyer, who held the first chair of public international law at the Faculty of Law at the University of Athens, was very critical, I would say was scathingly critical, of this arrangement in his lectures at the Hague Academy of International Law entitled Le Change de Population. He emphasized the manifest incompatibility of the compulsory exchange of population with a newly introduced human rights regime, the nascent human rights regime by the League Minorities Treaties and the Post-War Mixed Claims Commission. As he succinctly wrote, the denial to individual to freely choose whether to abandon their place of residence amounted to treating them comme de bétail, like cattle to be sold or exchanged. Even though he acknowledged that the exchange of populations, which was agreed to in Lausanne, was a realistic option imposed by the special circumstances of the defeat of the Greek army in Asia Minor, he insisted that it constituted an anachronism and a regression upon uh, the progressive transformation of the international community by introducing the rule of law in international affairs. This was manifested by the refusal of the immediately interested parties Greece and Turkey yet to acknowledge the paternity of the exchange of population. As to the uh, amnesty which was granted, uh, by the statement appended to the Treaty of Lausanne, all crimes committed between August 1st, 1914 and November 20th, 1922 would be amnesty and prosecution of suspects would be either called off or discontinued. Amnesties had been common arrangements in peace agreements, in peace treaties prior to the Treaty of Lausanne. They were introduced in order to achieve lasting peace by excluding the punishment of individuals for crimes committed during the conflict or collaboration with the enemy. In this light, the prosecution of individuals and 
the achievement of justice was seen not as the cornerstone of peace, but as its impediment. However, this rationale appears to have been abandoned by the peace treaties of World War I, which included special provisions on the prosecution of perpetrators of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and in the case of the German emperor, the waging of war in violation of international treaties and international morality. Uh, the Armenian Genocide of 1915 was condemned as a crime against humanity by France, Britain, and Russia, and the Ottoman leaders were warned of criminal prosecution. This prospect was eventually provided in the Treaty of Sèvres and was materialized in the sentencing of the perpetrator, perpetrators of the Armenian massacres by special tribunals created by the Ottoman government in 1919. The statement on amnesty in the Treaty of Lausanne constituted a reversal of this development and a return to the traditional practice of awarding amnesty as an option to forgive and forget, rather than justice served as the basis of peace. As a result, the Armenian genocide, genocidal acts against uh, the Greek populations uh, living around the Black Sea. The perpetration of crimes against humanity and war crimes were left unpunished, and the sentences that had already imposed were annulled. This does not exclude the acknowledgement by way of treaty formal treaty provision of the violations of the law of war committed by the Greek army during the armed conflict. This is expressly stated in Article 59 of the Treaty of Lausanne, but it is an acknowledgement nonetheless. The Development alongside the, future, the failure of the criminal prosecution of individuals for war crimes under the Versailles Treaty led to a state of mind of impunity with respect to mass atrocities that made the Holocaust possible. The infamous words of Adolf Hitler are well known. Who, after all, remembers the Armenian? In concluding, the Treaty of Lausanne has achieved lasting peace by being a monument to realism at the expense of the rule of law. Two of its principal means towards this aim, the compulsory exchange of populations and amnesty of international crimes, have been abandoned as <coughs> options sanctioned by the law. The unmixing of populations through compulsory exchange or resettlement was applied in the aftermath of World War II in relation to the German minorities in Eastern Europe and the partition of British India into India and Pakistan. In both cases, its essential inhumanity was plain to see and in the case of India and Pakistan led to bloodshed. The compulsory exchange of population is now considered as incompatible with human rights law. Similarly, while amnesties continue to be applied as tools for post-conflict settlement, they constitute a matter of controversy and appear to be an exception to the rule of criminal accountability for international crimes. In this light, the Treaty of Lausanne has indeed maintained peace between the two principal stakeholders, but not through, not through justice, but by legitimizing exercises in inhumanity and impunity. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Antonopoulos, uh, for your insightful presentation. Uh, uh, the title of your presentation reminds me the, the famous phrase of Raymond Aron, peace uh, through law approach. Uh, but uh, this is the, 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 the other, uh, a big discussion about peace and, uh, uh, and the rule of law. 
So, uh, I'm coming to the second uh, uh, speaker of uh, our panel, uh, who is Professor Akhtar, Professor of Sociology, Istanbul University, uh, who is going to speak about change in Turkish nationalism and transformation of the state narratives in relation to Lausanne. Professor Akhtar, the floor is yours. My talk is divided into two sections. Uh, in the first section, I shall try to uh, delineate three different narratives or state narratives related to Lausanne Treaty of 1923, which was prevalent in Turkey after 1923 uh, until now. Uh, in the second part, I shall try to focus on some popular TV series, to be precise, historical dramas in Turkish, shaping up the last stage where I assume uh, Lausanne Treaty is portrayed as a cut-off from the Ottoman past. The founding fathers of the Turkish Republic and the delegation negotiating peace at Lausanne in 1923 were mostly army officers and diplomats from the Ottoman Foreign Office, having experienced nearly 10 years of war from Balkan Wars to the 1922, the ideology of victimhood was dominant among them. The heart of the rigid program which Turkish delegation was insisting on was independence and sovereignty. Uh, we must also mention the importance of asking for absolute equality, treatment as a sovereign state among sovereign states and equal among peers. That was the major motto of the Turkish delegation, especially Smet Persia. And this was at the end quite boring for the uh, foreign uh, plenipotentiaries. Lord Curzon once said, Ismet, you remind me very much of a music box. You play the same old melody every single day until you make us all ill. Sovereignty, sovereignty, sovereignty. This was a cheat in the final document, no doubt about that. Uh, Turkish nationalism from that process of Lausanne emerged victoriously and uh, American ambassador Bruce summary of the conference saying Ismet Pasha won a diplomatic victory. It was a clear-cut victory, no doubt about that. And starting from early 20s until 19, at the end of 1940s, this was the dominant narrative among the uh, state elite and also among the educated elite. But I'm underlining the term elite, all right? maybe 100,000, 200,000 people in the population of 16 million people. Starting from late 40s, uh, a new type of undercurrent narrative started to develop uh, in Islamic conservative circles. As historian Gökhan Cetinsaya notes, one can trace Lausanne's conspiracy theories back to anti-Semitic nationalist Islamic writings of the figures like Jawad Rifat Atilhan and Najib Fazl Kesekere. Uh, Najib Fazl is an important figure because he was a source of inspiration for President Erdogan, as he had admitted several times. Uh, according to those two guys, Atilhan and Kesekere, Lausanne Treaty was a Jewish plot masterminded by the Turkish chief rabbi, Naim uh, Hayim Nahum, a consultant in the Turkish delegation at Lausanne, and their conspiracy theory set out how 1923 Lausanne Treaty represented a major defeat in Turkey. This is the title of the book. This was originally published in 65. And uh, through this agreement, through this international treaty, it was uh, paving the way of the abolition of caliphate in March 24, weakened Turkish society morally, intellectually, spiritually, and destroyed. Lausanne destroyed the unity and consciousness of Islam. And for that reason, the title of the book, Lausanne, 
a victory or a defeat, right. Uh, according to uh, the third thing, oh, oh thank you, uh, the third stage or uh, the third narrative is uh, Ismet Pasha's narrative because in mid 60s uh, we had we had left wing movements developing in Turkey and the anti imperial imperialist uh, logic of the Lausanne was put forward by Inan himself. This is an a, a interesting anecdote he tells uh, Curzon, tell, to Lord Curzon telling him, you are refusing everything now, but I'm putting all these things into my pocket. One day you'll come in front of us, kneel in front of us, then I'll take the things out of my pocket and you are going to accept it. And he says, I never did that. I never accepted foreign debt from the imperialists, etc. Therefore, old Pasha was playing towards the uh, left-wing politics at that time. Now, can we do that? Now, these are talks of Adon very recently, and it says they showed us the Serbs Treaty in 1920 and then persuaded us to agree the Lausanne 23. Afterwards, some have tried to pass off the Lausanne as a victory, all is obvious, which is not a victory, he said. And uh, another talk, uh, again Lausanne uh, in 2016, however, we are a nation that still feels the sorrow, sorrow of our losses at the Lausanne. Now, this, this feeling of victimhood uh, is a very influential ideological apparatus in Turkey. And this is something related to sociological reality of the country because Turkey underwent a major transformation in 50s, 60s until now, migration to the big cities and people who were displaced from one place to another. And now, uh, about 10% peasant population remaining in Turkey, 90% urbanized people. And these are the sociological shocks, and we need, uh, we need an excuse. We need a reason why all this happened to us, and this is because of bloody Lausanne. That's the argumentation. And according to this ideology modernizing turkish elites republican people party kemalists etc also also criminal because they said yes to everything since 1923 onwards okay they did everything possible to destroy our islamic past this is terrible and you know the things like uh, uh, in the conceptual framework, there is an East and it is against the West. There is Kemalist power versus Islamic opposition. The authoritarian Kemalist state versus democratic populist Islamic opposition. Center versus periphery. Black Turks against white Turks. White Turks are the westernized one. And uh, they are responsible for the abolition of caliphate, dissolution of sultanate, adoption of Swiss, penal, uh, Swiss code, replacing the Islamic courts, replacing Ottoman script with the Roman alphabet, closing down all the tech cares and seminaries, etc. And here the, we find the definition of Kulturkampf, the cultural war going on in Turkey. Now, uh, this uh, process, uh, the uh, binary oppositions and creating everybody as, uh, you know, renegade, etc., uh, can be seen in the researches done by the, uh, by the uh, polling institutions. Uh, there is one question. Will the Treaty of Lausanne end or become null and void in 2023? 48% in the survey says yes. And in terms of education, there's no big difference. 43% of the university students say yes to that. And in terms of AKB voters, Erdogan's party voters, this reaches to 62%. Therefore, we are not playing an elite game anymore. 
It is a mass entrenched ideology. Okay. And uh, another research done by Mustafa Aydin, he is here. Uh, there is a question. Do you think that there are undisclosed secret articles of Lausanne Treaty, which makes the uh, you know westernized elite sign those things and they are you know, criminals? Uh, in 2022, it's 22%. I mean, that includes university uh, students too. Uh, this is a decent survey done. Now we are not talking about elite politics anymore. Now, how it is done? That's a technical question. How can you convince such a large section of the society about these urban legends? That's a good question, isn't it? I have one answer. You show historical dramas, TV series, continuously on Turkish state channel. Okay, let's go. Now, the first one, 150 episodes from 2017-2021, Seat of Throne, Tayyip Taht Abdülhamid, is the life of Abdülhamid II. Uh, uh, he's surrounded with the enemies, and, you know, as Greeks, you know the term Ethnos Anadelphon, huh? Okay, Turks and Greeks are very similar. We are all surrounded with the enemies, and we don't have friends. We don't have brothers. Uh, I mean, uh, we are the mirror image in terms of nationalist uh, situation. And if you uh, follow the episodes, Abdul Hamid II is looking like President Erdogan. You can follow it. You can follow certain speeches in the episodes. I mean, something happens in Turkish politics, and two weeks later, it is on the TV, on the state channel, could be reached in every village. Now, I'll try to do the translation. The Sultan sends his major spy to London to dig out British secrets and plots against the Ottomans. I, I followed your advice. I entered to the project room. I have seen their terrible aspirations. As far as I see, the target of the uh, British is you and the Caliphate. And the target is 1901. It says New World. Draw the new map. Israel state is formed in Palestine. Bulgaria comes to Istanbul. Greeks took all the islands, including Smyrna. Macedonian state. Greater Serbia. Two Bosnian Muslims are there too. Albanian state. Cyprus is connected to London. Any new state in Syria, colonial state, Armenia, taking Eastern Anatolia, myself, and Istanbul, Another state is formed. There's an Orthodox cross on top of it. And we have Central Anatolia as Turkey. Now, the other one is uh, formation of the Ottoman Empire, 13th century, the Reddish Act to rule, 150 episodes again. And now, I want to show you the sexiest part of my talk. How on earth all these things are absorbed and, you know, articulated by Turkish people. Uh, we had elections and some of the members of the AKP wanted to be the member of the parliament. They put certain attire, you know, reminding or referencing to this 
TV series. And this guy, Osman Yavuz, wants to be an MP. And he's acting like a clown. Okay, let's go. And that's his election trail. And here are the other guys, or one lady, uh, pretending to be the same. Okay. And let's pass this. Uh, this is very important. This is very important. This was Tahsin Pasha, Ground Vizier of Abdul Hamid. And this actor now is a member of parliament. Okay? Go. And during the inauguration ceremony of Erdogan 10 days ago, he is posturing in the same way in the inauguration ceremony. In Turkey, life follows the art. I'm, so, I'm sorry to say that. Go on. And here we have artifacts from Turkish radio television website. You can buy these axes, you can buy these medals, you can buy these rings, all the you know, actors using in the, in the TV series, and you can buy the uniform of Abdul Hamid II and says, while you are watching at home this TV series, you can feel like him. <laughs> and these are, the, these are the things which I picked from social media, Facebook, etc. That's how Turkish people are watching these TV series. That's depressing. Last one. Uh, AKP has a branch in Vienna, and according to uh, recent regulations, it is possible for the Turks to vote for their party if they are living abroad. And some of the Turks living in Vienna went to the Turkish Council and voted. Thank you. Now, uh, you can say that this is something, the craziness of the Turks. No, 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 it's not like that. Uh, recently, Booker Prize was taken by Georgi Gospod, you know, and he published a beautiful book, Time Shelter. I put three editions, Turkish, English, and the Greek one. If you have time, read it. It's a great summer reading. Thank you for patience. Thank you. century, one uh, inspired by the Lausanne Treaty, one that has been the most, uh, that has found its most complete early implementation in the Lausanne Treaty, which is a model of uh, homogeneous nation states, implying uh, population transfers to fit people with borders, and the other model being the alternative, the exact uh, opposite, that is the model of the free movement of people. Uh, represented by uh, the European Union. There is uh, no doubt possible the two models are deeply uh, incompatible. So I would like to uh, review in this short presentation how the two models have been in competition in the last uh, century and what this competition can uh, tell us for the prospects of the Greek-Turkish relationship. So I will, I will first start with the uh, Lausanne Treaty itself, its emergence and its consolidation as, as a model. Then I will uh, present the emergence of the alternative model right after the Second World War. 
the, the, the nature of this uh, paradigm uh, in the European Union of free movement of people. And last, I will uh, finish with uh, a discussion on whether the model of the free movement of people in the European Union is applicable to the uh, region and the Greek-Turkish relationship. So regarding the emergence of the Lausanne Treaty model, uh, it, it all started with the demise of the Ottoman Empire at the end of the 19th century in the greater Balkan region. The expulsion of foreigners is nothing new, uh, but there is no doubt that it is in this uh, greater Balkan region that uh, it found its most complete implementation at the time of the demise of the Ottoman Empire. This was the situation on the eve of the First Balkan War in uh, 1912. Already beforehand, the Treaty of Berlin in 1878 had uh, resulted in significant shifts of population, uh, mostly of Muslims, towards, uh, towards Istanbul. Uh, the, uh, the First Balkan War so the, uh, the, the division of the remaining uh, Ottoman territories in Europe between uh, the, the victors of the war, including uh, Greece, resulting in a large uh, demographic uh, transfers to, uh, to, uh, Turk, to modern Turkey. But it's important to say that these uh, transfers were not uh, uh, officially organized through treaties. They were the, the consequence of border transfers, but they were not organized and made compulsory like the Treaty of Lausanne uh, did in 1923. Uh, so the, uh, the innovation of the Treaty of Lausanne in this, in this context has, has been already uh, mentioned is the compulsory character, the inclusion in international law in the multilateral treaty of massive exchanges of populations. By doing so, the treaty uh, and its uh, accompanying uh, convention uh, recognized and specified a clear uh, model of homogeneous nation states. One in which a population should fit within uh, national borders and the population of one state should reflect uh, uh, its, uh, its, its prevailing uh, ethnicity. The uh, Lausanne Treaty was not a complete separation, of course, of Greeks and Turks. Uh, it included many provisions for the respect of minorities. The Greeks of Constantinople, like the, uh, the, the Muslims of Western Thrace, were uh, excluded from the compulsory exchange of population. So it was not meant to be a complete uh, separation of the two ethnicities. But nevertheless, it was uh, such a significant step in this direction that it remains as the model for this homogeneous nation state. It uh, was uh, taken, taken up by other powers, including uh, Nazi Germany, but also uh, the United Kingdom. It was a form of blueprint for British policy in India in 1947, in, uh, in Palestine in 1948, and also in, uh, in Cyprus. Uh, the, the leaders of uh, the new Israeli uh, Israel state in 1948, led by uh, David Ben-Gurion, implemented a radical uh, version of this treaty in, in Palestine for the emergence of a purely uh, Jewish state. This was uh, the emergence of the model of homogeneous uh, national populations whose highlight is undoubtedly uh, the Treaty of, of Lausanne. In, uh, shortly after the last events I have mentioned in Israel, uh, an, an alternative treaty, uh, an alternative model emerged on the other uh, corner of Europe in the evolution of the French-German relationship. There were similarities in, uh, in this relation uh, compared with the situation in the Balkans, uh, take the provisions at the French eastern borders at the, uh, at the end of the Second World War, which prevented Germans to settle in Alsace uh, and Lorraine. So uh, there were a number of uh, uh, 
provisions in French law that uh, prevented Germans to settle in this area. And uh, this situation evolved very rapidly in the aftermath of the Second World War and in the aftermath of the creation of the Federal Republic of uh, Germany. The, uh, there were geopolitical factors for this evolution, uh, the one being the conciliatory attitude of West Germany uh, towards France, the, uh, the, its attitude within uh, the European Colin Steel Community, the settlement of the resolution of the Saar uh, border issue, the canalization of the model and of the model and so on and so forth, made that uh, Germany won the trust of France, and by 1957. France had abolished the provisions in its eastern territories to uh, prevent the settlement of German migrants. It had also removed the obligation of visa for German nationals in France. Germany wanted to go further and was genuinely interested in an alternative model uh, for truly geopolitical reasons. Geopolitics doesn't simply uh, lead to uh, Lausanne type model, it can also lead to uh, a model of free movement of people. Germany was interested in stabilizing other European countries while maintaining its immigration nearby, in, uh, in uh, near, nearby countries, neighboring countries. All this to, uh, to balance Soviet power in Europe. If other uh, European countries could benefit from the free movement of people, labor issues in those countries would be alleviated, thereby limiting the growth of communism in countries like Italy. Also, German immigrants, because Germany still had serious unemployment in the early 1950s, would not be forced to go overseas, but to stay nearby and repopulate eastern territories. All this would give Germany more influence in the relationship with the Soviet Union. So these were some of the uh, factors that led to a relaxation of the uh, migratory arrangements between France and Germany. Other factors had to do with the limited level of migratory pressure, especially as France uh, severed its ties with Algeria and Germany uh, experienced major economic growth. This, uh, this uh, model of free movement of people and therefore the break with the idea of homogeneous nation states was part and parcel of the bigger idea of an economic uh, single market among the participants <coughs> with its idea that trade flows could also substitute for migration flows and limit the implications of the shift to the free movement of people. So now I have reviewed how an alternative model to that of homogeneous nation states emerged at the onset of European integration. And it became a cornerstone of the European Union as we know it today. Over, over this period of European integration since the early 1950s, this model has proven exceptionally uh, successful. So uh, why? Despite the fact there were serious uh, border uh, contestations in Europe, had the free movement of people not, lead, uh, not led to uh, border disputes. So one has to do with the notion of the single market. That is, the free movement of people is deeply related to uh, a, a single market. That is, as people move, trade flows increases, capital. Uh, cross-border investments also increases, and each state becomes increasingly dependent on the single market for its own prosperity. And therefore, any contestation of borders is politically uh, very difficult because it would have economic, serious economic consequences. In addition, the European Union integrates the foreign policy of its members, thereby giving them a sense of, uh, of a shared uh, of a shared destiny. Therefore, over uh, 70 years of European integration and more than half a century of free movement of people, there has not been any serious border dispute. There has not even been uh, a, a major demographic shift in uh, border areas that could lead to, uh, to further uh, border uh, disputes. So, it is 
it is an impressive uh, achievement. And uh, now I come to, to, the, to the last part of my talk to, to, to review the, the validity of each of those two models in the uh, Greek-Turkish uh, relationship uh, today. So undoubtedly, the Greek-Turkish uh, relationship is one in Europe in which the transition from one model to the next will be uh, the, most, uh, the most difficult. There has been uh, a deep uh, persistence of geopolitical rivalries between the two countries, starting with uh, Turkish policy in Cyprus in 1974. Greece came to uh, consider Turkey as its major security threat before uh, the, the Soviet Union. And this, uh, this problem, uh, in contrast to what was going on between France and Germany at the beginning of European integration, has had uh, clear implications on migratory policies. In uh, 1986, there were negotiations within the European community to uh, renew the association with Turkey and give Turkey uh, uh, some prospect of relaxation of migratory uh, policies. Uh, the Greeks uh, refused to relax uh, their policies, fearing the settlement of Turks in possibly contested border areas. Therefore, the, 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 the agreement with Turkey uh, came to nowhere. There were also other reasons behind that. But Greece has been, has been reluctant uh, to, uh, to relax migratory arrangements with Turkey uh, in great part due to uh, geopolitical factor. Uh, a favorable context between Greece and Turkey, uh, which could be alarming for, for Greece, but is, is here a favorable context, is that the uh, GDP per capita and wage levels between Greece and Turkey have been gradually converging over the last four decades. This implies that there is no risk of major migration flows in the event of relaxation of migration uh, policies. Nevertheless, it's clear that as Turkey uh, counts 85 million people and Greece only 10.5 million people, there is uh, a fear uh, among Greek leaders that uh, any form of integration of Turkey in the EU and a break with the model of inherited from Lausanne towards a freer movement of people could create an untenable situation for Greece and uh, result in, uh, in more, even more migration problems that, uh, than Greece knows already. Therefore, it's important in the case of uh, European countries proceeding towards the, the, the definitive abolition of the transfer of population in the Lausanne model that major countries of immigration in Europe take a major share of the uh, inflow of Turks toward Europe that will necessarily uh, follow, uh, and I think about Germany in particular. But in, um, in the Greek Turkish relationship, uh, it seems that there is no major risk of uh, uh, flows, especially from Greek, from Turkey to Greece. The main flow would probably be from Greece towards, uh, towards Istanbul. So, uh, to conclude, uh, there is uh, the 20th century since the Treaty of Lausanne has been uh, marked by the competition between two model one uh, encapsulated by the Treaty of Lausanne and its, its antithesis uh, in the European Union with the free movement uh, of people. The latter has uh, uh, an exceptionally good uh, record over a century in not resulting in uh, border disputes. It's clear, however, that the Greek-Turkish relationship will be one of the most difficult. In case this, uh, this new model could extend to this region, it will validate it, validate it and pave the way for uh, its expansion to even more areas of uh, border disputes. Thank you, Mr. Kong, for your uh, presentation. Uh, you highlighted uh, the parameters uh, and the provisions that have made uh, the peace uh, treaty a model and paradigm of peace building.
Okay, we're coming to the last uh, speaker of uh, our session, uh, Professor yeah, exactly. Vigilin, uh, Professor of Economics. We have an economist in our company. I'm not an economist, actually, I'm an economic no, historian. But I have spent about like 30 years actually. About uh, a key to this building towards a deep history of the land. Professor Vitirin, the close yours. Okay, I actually changed the title slightly. So, going back to the title, so it's not towards, it's sort of in pursuit of a people's history of Lausanne. I've been working on the exchange of populations for the last 30 years or so, so my talk is going to sort of revolve around the exchange of populations. Um, I mean, I thought I would be the only elephant in the room, but then this morning, Costas also sort of alluded to the tragic human dimension of the exchange, so there are like multiple elephants in the room. Uh, and it's also sort of challenging to speak in a, in a conference organized by Eliamep, where you have a lot of people with firm conviction over real politic as a sort of prism through which to see the past. So let's see how this is going to pair. Um, so, okay, this is, th this is the code I have at the beginning of my paper. Uh, these are the words of uh, Fernand Brodel. It, I mean, they belong to the perhaps most prominent uh, historian of the 20th century, who pointed out the, uh, the necessity of cooperation and communication between the disciplines that he called human sciences at the time. And that was 60 years ago. Let me open my time in. Okay. Uh, although much water has flown under the bridge since then, we can say that the barriers between the sciences or disciplines is still an issue. The necessity of cooperation and communication between disciplines that Roda suggested, not only in the above lines, but at every opportunity throughout his career, lies in his broad vision of history. This vision, in his words, is the sum of all possible histories a set of multiple skills and points of view, those of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. For Brodel, history, in fact, each of the humanities must be nourished by the methods and findings of other disciplines. In his view, it is possible to capture any society as a whole in a historical time only in this way. This meaningful appeal was not limited to this distinguished scholar, but also has been embraced by many scholars who were not necessarily members of the Annal School of which he was the most prominent representative. Many scholars have been explicitly or implicitly involved in other fields of science by adopting their methods, findings, and approaches. They have succeeded in moving their studies slightly away from the narrow framework, frameworks of their disciplines. Speaking for myself, from the very beginning of my career as a historian, I have made an effort to follow developments in most of the humanities as closely as possible, especially in anthropology, and with an absolutely good excuse. This had great repercussions for my career, both in terms of teaching and research. Karl Polanyi, Marcel Mauss, and Marshall Sachlins have affected my research and teaching in the field of economic history. Eric Wolf and Jack Tudy, uh, my social history-based studies on Ottoman and Turkish history. And Benedict Anderson's work has been a source of inspiration and guiding line in many respects in my work on nationalism, especially Turkish uh, and Greek nationalism, focusing on the intellectual dimensions of these two ideologies. All of the names that I have mentioned are anthropologists. But more important than all of this is that the studies that inspired me to, cho to choose the Turkish Greek population exchange, on which most of my research was based, was focused as a field of study, and to approach it in a different line from the existing scholarship, were also produced by an anthropologist. I would like to express it frankly here that had it not been the work of René Hichon, I could not have made the decision to choose the Turkish Greek population exchange as a field of study. In this short presentation, I want to sort of highlight uh, to you what an important role this prominent social anthropologist has played in my career. Uh, and while paying off a personal debt, I want to use this also as an opportunity to underline a much more general point. As naive as it may sound, this is the point of how anthropology can actually be decisive in determining the direction of perspective when dealing with historical events, as it is most clearly shows itself in the example of the exchange not any exchange, but the Greek-Turkish exchange of population. The exchange, which is quite convenient to be considered as a technical issue, has been reduced to an impersonal, shadowy, and abstract principle. 
formulated into a political device and celebrated as a diplomatic solution to be adopted while addressing conflicts between states. In this context, historical developments before and after this specific event have been interpreted along this line. And an exchange narrative, quite free from the human element, has become the dominant narrative of this tragic event at national and international levels. As, it, as I will discuss it, only after René Hirschhorn's studies, drawing upon the experience of people who were directly or indirectly affected by this historical event, came out, this dominant narrative began to sort of shatter and give way to a more human-oriented narrative. In a sense, it can be said that the exchange helped to remind us the relationship between two important disciplines, history and anthropology. Levi Strauss, who is regarded as the father of anthropology, highlights this close and dynamic relationship that has existed for a long time between two disciplines. He says that history and anthropology is the same adventure of the mind. But if we go back to Brodel again, he says, there is no society, however unsophisticated, which cannot be seen to have felt the clothes of the event, nor is there any, any society whose history has been entirely lost. René Hichon's Pioneering research on the Greeks of Asia Minor, who settled in Cochinia, played a pivotal role in bringing the human dimension to the fore when considering not only the Turkish Greek exchange, but also many similar population transfer events around the world. I was introduced to her work, especially her work, her book, for the first time when I was trying to sort of choose uh, population exchange as a subject for my thesis. When I started to read the literature on the exchange and saw how this event was handled on national and international platforms, I first noticed how much the national literature in Greece and Turkey, I can sort of mention a couple of things I published recently, how this event was handled on national and international platforms. I first noticed how much the national literature in Greece and Turkey was politicized or constructed along an ideological lane, and how the exchange uh, uh, was uh, represented, especially in a stereotypical way, in international literature. As I read the literature in Greece and Turkey, I realized how two diametrically opposed strategies were adapted for the same purpose. Both Greek and Turkish national historiographies have embraced this event and other historical events surrounding it from its inception, and while adding it to their own historical biographies, the Greeks chose to remember and Turks to forget. While for the Greeks, the population exchange with Turkey constituted the final stage of the Asia Minor disaster that extinguished the fire of Megalidea, it was accept accepted as a part of the War of Independence by the Turks, which was the most important step for the political and territorial construction of the new nation state for themselves. In the midst of these two opposing views, the story of the masses directly affected by the war and the subsequent population exchange, namely the refugees, exchanges, or immigrants, however you want to uh, use, whichever term you want to use, was told on their behalf with a rudimentary allusion to their experiences. While rewriting the biography of the Greek nation, Greek national historiography portrayed the difficult process of the Greek nation state called the refugee question, containing the stages of transfer, resettlement, and integration, as a heartwarming and legendary success story. Opening parentheses from time to time, it also refer referred to the masses who lived through the process of war and exchange. This narrative was further developed, incorporating a series of theologies for the enormous contribution made by the refugees to the Greece's economic development and cultural revival. The Turkish historiography, on the other hand, has been silent about the, about the exchange from the very beginning. And all the texts, including the speeches of Mustafa Kemal, which constitute the main story of the Liberation War, prefer not to say a special word on the exchange. Although the echoes of the process experience were most striking in the present parliamentary discussions, the population exchange as a historical phenomena and the refugees and exchanges as historical actors could not find a place in the newly formed national biography. I'm going to skip a lot. Now, coming to René Hichon, I have only three minutes or so. I mean, René Hichon, unlike our predecessors such as Michael, uh, John Campbell and Michael Hirschfeld, who used the refugees' experience as a kind of prison better understand the dynamics of wider Greek society, she puts refugees at the center of her research and sought to sort of compile detailed information on their experiences or life stories on the basis of households and neighbor, uh, neighborhoods in, in her fieldwork. She trailed the transformation of the inhabitants of Kokinia. 
and showed very successfully that this community sustained its social existence by, quote, creating permanent artifacts or reproducing the structure. But just like Hirschfeld, Hirschfeld and Campbell, her ethnographic research revealed many details uh, about not only refugee families, but also the inner dynamics of, Greek, of, the, of the Greek family, revealing how history, memory, refugee experience, and gender factors shape the life of a society. While concentrating on refugee and exchange ex experiences, René traced how the refugee identity was shaped and how the refugee, refugees went through this long process of integration from the moment they arrived in Greece. Now, I'm going to actually skip a lot of things and come to, the, come to my conclusion. I mean, there are a lot of things that I said, but I wasn't expecting the conference would actually give us like eight, ten minutes. So, what I want to say, I mean, in, in, this, in this whole thing, I hope they will publish the papers and there you will have the full story. Just to conclude, Remy Hishon, she has rebuilt the world of an Asia Minor refugee and exchange community living in a small suburb of Piraeus. For this project, I interviewed her, and I heard from her own mouth that she had no intention of overturning an existing narrative that had been constructed from the point of view of the state, that is, from top down. In fact, in my interview with her, I discovered that she didn't have a great awareness of her, how her findings and discussion affected the prevalent narrative of the exchange. Again, she told me that she is not a follower of the extent to which the findings she presented in her book and the discussions she produced affect the literature on the subject. She even added that she couldn't say anything specific other than a few general observations about the direction of research on exchange. Looking at the studies on exchange today, the most obvious point is that this literature operates through a framework that does not ignore the human element. As, as much as, just one more minute, as much as, uh, as, much as it did uh, as it, 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 in the past. So the work of an anthropologist in fact, help change the general perception of this event, at least for us the scholars. I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that the integration between disciplines that Brodel imagined almost 60 years ago is yet to come true, as it manifests itself clearly in the handling of a very important historical event, such as the exchange uh, between anthropology and history. We can say that this integration helped reconsider and refute some of the existing and hitherto undisputed thesis and produces more scientific and cons consistent approach instead. In this context, I think it is very important that names like René Hirschhorn, who have consciously or unintentionally initiated this integration, should be honored uh, when, when time comes. And if we are genuinely interested in developing our con uh, a constructive dialogue in promoting peace in between two countries, it is our responsibility to document and analyze this shared and turbulent history with an emphasis on the people who experience it, with a view that such tragedies do not recur. And I'm saying, after all, after all, states are not permanent, whereas people are. 